processing and reacting. Surveillance as a tool in control in controlling antimicrobial resistance in Canada and globally. Welcome, Dr. Sa Saxinger. Uh, thank you very much. And um, please let me know if there's any problems with the audio. Um, but I have enough material to discuss um, for about 45 minutes at least, and I really would like to encourage people who are listening to think of um, points they'd like to raise, questions they'd like to ask, to have a really useful and fruitful discussion at the end. Um, initially, my plan was to potentially um, describe the results of the antimicrobial resistance and utilization um, surveillance report, which um, I was one of the group uh, working on that report, which was also commissioned by the NCCID. But um, we're a little behind because um, fairly late in the stage of finalization, we um, decided to use a bit of a different approach in analyzing and presenting the results. And so out of respect for, for my colleagues to not produce something that's kind of half-baked, what I've chosen to do instead is to just bring up a number of issues and ideas that are very pertinent to antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial utilization surveillance in 2013 and in Canada. So there's, there's a bit of a wide-ranging format, I think, at play. And we can kind of start by saying, yes, this is Antibiotic Awareness uh, Week in Canada. It's also Antibiotic Awareness Week in the US um, through the CDC's Antibiotic uh, Week. And it also was Antimicrobial um, Antibiotic Awareness Day in, the, in um, Europe yesterday. And I think there's uh, quite a number of other countries also that are observing similar things around this time. And this has all been evolving over the past few years. And although we've known about antimicrobial resistance for a long time, it does seem as if there has been quite an upswelling in interest in resistance and um, appreciation for the potential dangers of resistance, evidenced by things like the video that was put out by the WHO, which actually discusses AMR as a global health security emergency. This was in the summer in 2013. The dangers of hubris on human health, the rapid emergence of antimicrobial drug resistance. Then there was the very well-publicized um, comments from the UK um, Chief Medical Officer, Dame Sally Davies, who quite frankly told people that she was afraid she was going to need a hip replacement and would die of a superbug for which there was no antibiotics. And she um, terms this a catastrophe that ranks with terrorism and climate change. And then most recently in September, the US CDC put out an antibiotic resistance threats in the US. And it basically ranked threats. And it, basic, it was a report that tried to look at the burden of antimicrobial resistance and the threats posed kind of ranking organisms um, on human health. So this has been um, a lot of activity lately. And the reasons for that are manifold. Um, so antimicrobial resistance for selected pathogens over time, this is just a classic graph that tells us what happened over time. We saw the introduction of um, penicillin led to penicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, the introduction of cloxicillin, which was then a wonder drug, led to the re um, introduction of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which took a little bit longer to really become predominant, but really did increase steadily over the 80s, 90s to a pretty high rate in many places. Um, the second line on the graph there reflects enterococci resistant to vancomycin. Um, the number three line reflects Pseudomonas aeruginosa resistant to imipenem. And the uh, number four line reflects Acinetobacter species resistant to imipenem. So uh, carbapenem resistant gram negatives are a hot topic right now as well. And it also extends beyond antibacterials to uh, the realm of fungi where we see increasing numbers of pathogenic candida species uh, resistant to fluconazole. And this is a uh, infographic that was part of the CDC um, resistance report. And it basically is trying to, in a very simple way, describe what happens when resistance develops. The resistance starts with the use of an antimicrobial, be it for um, prevention of infection or growth promotion in animals, or for a human with a bacterial infection, or somewhat unfortunately, sometimes a viral infection. And if you develop resistant bacteria in your GI tract, then you can spread that resistance either at home or in a healthcare setting. And within the healthcare setting, we have the additional complication of 
Um, the healthcare facility itself can be a vehicle for, for spread from surfaces or from healthcare workers, and that's why hand washing is important. Um, in the environment, of course, fertilizer or water that contains animal feces with drug-resistant bacteria can actually get into the food chain and then result in people carrying resistant bacteria as well. So this is just trying to establish that, yes, antibiotic use promotes resistance and that this occurs in different places. And the other thing that has been eminently clear in the past few years is that um, things like the NDM1 uh, bacteria uh, show us that resistance spreads and um, it travels where people travel and there's really no way around that. So the responsibility, I think, for antimicrobial resistance goes well beyond um, national borders because it is really a very permeable border when you get right down to it. And so if you think about your human being as a host at, at risk, they get exposed to a pathogen, and the pathogen might carry its own genetic armamentarium of resistance um, techniques, basically. Then you can put that in the context of community or agricultural antibiotic use, then the host and the pathogen relationship gets affected by antibiotics. Likewise, hospital antibiotic use, which is a very intensive place of antibiotic use, also affects the pathogen and the host. And that's where resistance happens. But infection control helps in the realms of hospital antimicrobial use. And hospital and community-based stewardship can also try to reduce the development of resistance in those settings. A public health crisis. Um, this is the CDC report. And just a few stats from that. They estimated that there's 2 million resistant infections, and at least 20, 23,000 deaths yearly from resistant infections. They um, estimated a quarter of a million people um, have C. diff infection in hospital. And they further said that 70% of the bacteria that cause hospital-acquired infections are resistant to at least one of the drugs most commonly used to treat them. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have options, but it tells us something about where things are heading. The other issue is that sometimes with some bug drug combinations, the second or third choice drugs may be less effective, more toxic, and or more expensive. So can you define this as a crisis? Well, what we have um, going up are the number of pathogens displaying resistance and increasing multi-drug resistant strains. We have increasing numbers of compromised hosts as the successes of modern medicine result in you know, people with um, malignancies and people with transplants and people with immune conditions receiving chemotherapy and immunomodulators that can increase susceptibility to infections. Mortality attributable to antimicrobial resistance has done nothing but increase. And the speed with which resistant microbes can spread globally also has gone up, as have the cost of healthcare deriving from resistant microbes. What we have dropping is the power of the antibiotic armamentarium to deal with so many resistant pathogens, the amount of research and development dedicated to antimicrobials, and in a lot of cases, funding for public health infrastructure. So we need to use antibiotics properly. We want to limit the spread of resistance. It's quite unclear that we can defeat resistance. Um, this is a quote that I like pulling out because it's very prescient. Um, the future of humanity and microbes will likely evolve as episodes of our wits versus their genes. And um, that was in 1959, which was really quite early in the antibiotic era. And um, it turns out to be eminently true. So. This did not show up. My image didn't show up. Hmm, that's unfortunate. Um, so is this fear-mongering? Um, occasionally, we have cases of untreatable infections, and that has been sometimes called the end of the antibiotic era. Um, I don't think that untr an untreatable infection or even a handful of untreatable infections is the end of the antibiotic era, but it's certainly a disturbing sign. Um, history shows us that resistance increases and that the genetic arsenal of microorganisms is very impressive and evolves quite quickly. And we do know that the antibiotic pipeline is at a low ebb and um, that is something that might require some different approaches. Now I'm hoping that others of my pictures have not disappeared because it might become more confusing, but we'll see how it goes. Um, it might be a different version of PowerPoint. Um, so. Talking about resistance worldwide, 
Um, you can get pieces of data that tell you what's going on. Um, comparing um, MRSA, um, um, greater than 50% of the stop aureus is MRSA in some countries, and 26 to 50% in other countries. And this type of data is very useful to know what's going on worldwide. When you look at other places, just looking at some data that I was accessing last night, this is the proportion of third generation cephalosporin resistant Klebsiella pneumonia isolates in um, countries participating in the ECDC surveillance. Um, and it basically was current as of 2013, 11, 18. And we have um, up over 70% resistance of a common bug to one of the most common um, gram-negative drugs used to treat it. And that's a bit of a sobering statistic. Looking further at another example of a fairly common bug and drug, um, you can see that Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the European U Union, um, there are areas with incredibly high resistance. And it does make you wonder, um, you know, what is different in that place? How has this arisen? You do want to know more about the numbers of the data, and some of those details are available when you drill into this website. But you can see that some places, it's under 5% resistance. Other places, over 50%, over 25%. And knowing that is incredibly important for people who practice medicine in those areas to plan antimicrobial therapy appropriately. Um, for Canadian data, I did find some data on, uh, just as a parallel, Pseudomonas aeruginosa susceptibilities. And the CANWORD um, Alliance has an interactive website that had data on 330 um, Pseudomonas isolates from across Canada. And it showed that our ceftazidime resistance rate was 85.2%. So we are less than some places and more than others. But when we look um, for other um, data on this type of resistance, and I do want to clarify that there is a bit of a difference. When we talk about hospital antimicrobial resistant organisms like MRSA and VRE, these are isolates that spread um, that are basically already born that way, not made that way. So it's a strain that's spreading within a hospital, and there's um, infection control um, feeds into that, and antibiotic use can select for that strain to be um, more predominant, but antibiotic use has not created that MRSA at this time. That's just what's spreading. When we look at other types of resistance surveillance, we can see um, the evolution of resistance that's related to the utilization of antibiotics in a you know intensive way in a place over time. And so that's where we actually sometimes have less data in Canada, just from the way things have evolved. Um, this is a website that actually offers a very strange but somehow fascinating um, way of looking at things. They have an indicator of a combined resistance score, where they look at the overall ranking of resistance in bugs and drug pairings over time for countries that have that data available to them. And um, we don't really have data for Canada, so we're the big white north unknown. And then you can see that there's some places that have higher resistance scores than others. And again, with that information, you'd be tempted to go back and try to find out why is that so and can you affect how this is happening. Which kind of brings me to a, an issue that's important, which is antibiotic use um, is a driver of resistance. And stewardship is a topic of great interest um, nationally with new Accreditation Canada requirements for stewardship in hospital settings, and also because it's the right thing to do. And the word is actually derived from an Anglo-Saxon word, meaning the keeper of the hall. And I like that idea. You're keeping the hall. The hall is a place of community. The hall is the center of the community, and you're trying to keep it good. And good antimicrobial stewardship is a practice that ensures the optimal selection, dose, and duration of a treatment for the best clinical outcome for prevention or treatment of an infection while producing the fewest toxic effects and the lowest risk for subsequent resistance. So this is, um, this is a concept that's very important. It is not really the driving force behind this discussion, because really, I'm more moving around issues of surveillance here. But it is an action step that follows from surveillance. Now, surveillance is derived from basically French roots for watching over. And if you look at the classic Merriam-Webster definition, close and continuous observation of one or more persons for the purpose of direction, supervision, or control. So you're watching for a reason. 
The standard current def definition in public health is public health surveillance is the ongoing systematic collection, analysis, interpretation, and dissemination of health data for the planning, implementation, and evaluation of public health action. So at a quick glance, that seems somewhat boring with a lot of words, but every single one of the words in that definition turns out to be important. We're going to kind of wander through some issues around that now. Now, so public health systems, if you look in textbooks, I'm not a public health person, but I'm keenly interested in it, are said to have five essential functions, population health assessment, health promotion, health protection, disease and injury prevention, and surveillance. And when you look at all of those tools and actions, public health surveillance is considered the best weapon to avert epidemics. And public health successes, of course, are largely silent because nothing is happening. It's only when there is a breakthrough, when there's some um, failure of public health infrastructure or unanticipated epidemic that was not surveilled, suddenly people are concerned about it. So it's, it's always been plagued by quiet success. And going back into the history of surveillance, um, I found this very interesting. Um, in 1741, in a colony in Rhode Island, there was a decree that tavern keepers are required to report contagious diseases among their patrons. And I thought that was an interesting happenstance. Two years later, in the same place, they actually made the first move for required reporting of smallpox, yellow fever, and cholera. And the concept of notifiable diseases, I think, is an important one. That just means that if we have confirmation of a specific disease in the community, it has to be brought to attention to the appropriate people. Now, after we established that surveillance is an important and even legislated um, activity, um, it's more than the collection of data. I think there was evolving appreciation in the mid-1900s that the next step is that the information must go somewhere. So the data and interpretations have to be disseminated to all who have contributed and to, contributed and to all others who need to know. And we will talk about the need to know again. But um, it's interesting to think about who does need to know this. Um, to whom should this information be available? And for what purposes? Then the next step in the evolution of surveillance thinking probably was the 21st World Health Assembly, where they actually linked this to doing something. So not just dissemination of information, but actually linking within surveillance um, to the idea of planning, implementation, and assessment of disease control. And so, and this also reinforced the three main features of surveillance, which are the systematic collection of pertinent data, orderly consolidation and evaluation of the data, and prompt dissemination of results to those who need to know, particularly those in position to take action. No, so, it's just a webinar. <laughs> okay. Then the next um, issue is how do you tell if a surveillance system is good. There's a lot of rubrics out there, but things that come up um, in terms of looking at what is required in surveillance is are you watching something that's important? Does it have defined objectives and components? Is the data useful? How much does it cost? How, uh, how high quality are the data? So accuracy, how representative is the data, and how complete is the data? and the quality of the system itself. So is it a simple, flexible system? Is it portable? Is it stable? Is it basically something that can be sustained? And there's all these features rolled into that, which when you think about them are all really quite intuitive, and yet it's still sometimes useful to lay them all out. And Hi, Dr. Saxinger, sorry for interrupting. Yep. I just wanted to remind all the participants to please put your phone on mute. We have some background noise that's um, becoming a little disruptive. And if you put your phone on mute, no one else can hear you. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, so I think that modern surveillance, we were talking about the step of saying, well, we have to watch what's going on. We have to watch what's going on, and we have to tell everyone what's going on. And then the last step is we have to watch what's going on, tell everyone what's going on, and do something about it. And so the link between information and action turns out to be a very key thing. And um, I just like this quote. Um, the reason for collecting, analyzing, and disseminating information on a disease is to control that disease. Collection and analysis should not be allowed to consume resources if action does not follow. So a failure of dissemination and a failure of action on the data really makes you wonder why you bother collecting it in the first place. 
And I think that that's a very timely reminder as well as we look at how we might evolve the current surveillance systems um, within Canada and actually as surveillance evolves worldwide as well. Another thing that's important to consider is the type of surveillance that is done. It's kind of classic that vertical surveillance has evolved. And so you get a patchwork of things happening where people are interested in their disease, their lifetime study of a disease, and they surveil that disease and they collect information and that information goes back to their control program. And it tends to be quite siloed and it tends to address specific concerns that arise. Um, I think just more people would imagine that an integrated surveillance system would be better where you can have a similar structure, similar processes, and actually potentially sometimes the same personnel who are trying to collect information on many diseases and feed that information back to control programs and that this would be a more efficient way to go about it. But it also does pr pr um, create a lot of challenges in terms of how do you actually coordinate this activity and I think that it's, it's something to approach very thoughtfully because you can see that there would be some real benefits to being able to integrate surveillance and have a system that is responsive to things as they arise rather than having things that um, evolve in response to a particular concern and are standalone. So a number of publications have come out, and if people are interested, I can give you some references that identify challenges to surveillance right now. And to be honest, um, the current approach to public health surveillance seems to be fragmented in, in many systems. One problem is that the ongoing public health information systems aren't always integrated with um, surveillance and prevention activities. And as we kind of alluded to in the last slide, you might have a collection of independent surveillance systems for specific things um, that has arisen and don't necessarily interconnect with each other. It can be very difficult to address new emerging health problems because you're not looking for it. It's not been anticipated. There's no system to look for it. And timeliness is always a challenge, both after the occurrence of a health event and also timeliness of access to data, which has gotten some media attention lately because I think um, data has to be used to be, I guess, justified. And um, it is an important thing in the world of communicable diseases to be aware of what's going on currently. And of course, inadequate funding is a per perennial concern especially when you have a field that is successful only when nothing seems to be going on. So I will briefly talk about a project um, that the NCCID put out a request for proposals for. And um, it was basically a request to look at the um, antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic utilization surveillance systems in Canada and worldwide and try to use that information to help make recommendations on evolution of our systems in Canada. And as I mentioned earlier, I originally was planning to share results of this study, but at the moment we're doing a different approach to the analysis and I think that it would be um, in inappropriate for me to share that material when it's still kind of half-baked. On the project, has been a collaboration between the um, Association of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Canada with the Stewardship and Resistance Committee specifically, the NCCID, our host today, and UBC and the U of A. And we had a project team and we had an excellent steering committee from across Canada with medical and veterinary representation and the funding was from the NCCID. And these are the project objectives that we were intending to address, which were enumerate Canadian AMR and AMU surveillance programs, determine core elements, um, identify missing elements, and recommend some actions. And the data gathering approach um, was, had two aspects. One was a systematic literature review, and also key informant interviews with qualitative analysis. And the systematic search, this, these numbers might be slightly um, different now, but um, at the time that we last presented this, 22 databases were identified um, and uh, searching revealed 8,837 records. Um, there was a gray literature search and we went through, the, the records were all basically screened and we were looking for features of surveillance programs to include in the enumeration of surveillance. The survey was uh, semi-structured um, interview that was snowballed, um, recruiting key informants, and um, we pilot tested the tool and then collected 
data from our interviewees from January to March of this year. And at the time um, that we last reported on this, there were 16 human surveillance programs identified. Um, some of them were defunct um, or potentially just still e in evolution and not yet reporting. Um, six of them were provincial or sub-provincial in scope, and um, they all had, I guess, differing degrees of um, adherence to um, aspects that would make them an actual surveillance program. Four were natu national, but with a narrower focus on, in terms of the, um, the scope of the organisms that were looked at, and three were national and broader in scope, um, of which one is not has not been active for the last few years, the CBFN. The CANWORD program, I actually showed you some data from that program, and it has up-to-date information on the website. And the CNIS program, which looks at hospital-acquired infections in Canada. And we did take a little bit of time to look at the major Canadian programs um, to give a bit of an idea of what's happening with those programs. Uh, the CNIS program is well known to most people involved in public health infectious diseases, medical microbiology in Canada. And it um, provides active surveillance of nosocomial infections and antimicrobial resistant um, organisms in sentinel sites, which are um, quite representative of a lot of the Canadian population. And the most recent reports issued have been on MRSA, VRE, and C. diff. There is some other information available on a project basis, including on carbapenem resistant organisms. And again, this is focusing on hospital, the hospital domain. And this is a federal program under the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, the CANWORD program has voluntary prospective sampling. It seems to be about 10 to 15 hospitals submit 500 bacterial clinical isolates yearly from um, blood respiratory specimens, urine specimens, and wound specimens. And so it's a sample for a period of time of 500 isolates from 10 to 15 hospitals, which results in broad pathogen representation. Um, with 500 isolates per site, that's a reasonable number to be able to get an idea um, to some extent of what's going on. But this would reflect about approximately 5 to 10 percent of antibiogram isolates yearly. And the domain is mostly hospital. Some can include outpatient clinics in the emergency room, but it's unclear um, in some of the reports how much can be said to be from non-hospital um, specimens. And this is a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company supported and a liaison with academia at the University of Manitoba. Uh, the Canadian Bacterial Surveillance Network I will not speak about as much because there haven't been recent reports, although we believe there's still um, isolates being sent. And it also involves hospital specimens. And it also is a pharma and academic um, consortium. And the CPARS program, again, is one of the most well-known programs um, providing antibiotic resistance and antibiotic utilization data in Canada. And this provides, to some extent, farm-to-fork um, um, glimpse of antibiotic resistance by surveil surveilling isolates from abattoirs, retail meat, and from human salmonellosis across Canada. So it is um, limited to foodborne salmonella isolates in humans. And um, there have been, I think, attempts to get um, more uh, in-depth reporting of antimicrobial use, both in the veterinary and agri-food and also in human utilization in the community through the CPARS network that have been um, increasingly successful. And there's some very good data available now on antibiotic utilization from that group. But if we look back to our host at risk, and we look back to our pathogen, and we then look at antibiotic use in the agri-food sector. We also have antibiotic use in hospitals, and we have our resistance. We have CPARS that looks at um, agri-food um, and limited human infections. We have CNIS, which covers hospital-based infections very well. And for this purpose, I actually pulled agri-food and community separately because they are somewhat different domains. We really don't have that much looking at community um, antimicrobial resistance evolution in Canada presently. The CANWORD system does provide some of that information, but it is hospital-based, and um, the representation of the data in prospective sampling might be less than desired. So um, with that in mind, and looking back to a few points that came out of our project, some key themes that came up when we were discussing with our expert group, um, surveillance, 
um, people highlighted the need for it to be timely. That came up a great deal, accessible, representative, reliable, standardized, longitudinal, and of course funded. And that merges very well with um, the kind of official rubrics on how you evaluate surveillance systems. The other thing I wanted to pull out from those data um, in advance of the report are some of the perceived barriers to creating a, a cohesive surveillance system for antimicrobial resistance and utilization in Canada. And um, our surveilled experts brought up issues around confidentiality, um, issues around delay in data acquisition and transmission. Um, a perceived barrier also was how do you arrive on what information can and should be shared. Um, there was some fear of the validity of comparisons that could be drawn between places and also technologic difficulties with lab information systems that don't really talk to each other very well. And so the perceived barriers, I think, were largely practical ones and not really philosophic ones, which I think is a very good sign. And one other thing that had um, been a main goal for that project was um, what can we learn from other programs to help model what would be an ideal system here? And for the purposes of this talk, I just wanted to bring up a couple of programs as exemplars. One of them is the DANMAP program, and the other one is the ECDC EARSNET program. DANMAP is a kind of tortured acronym, Danish Integrated Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring and Research Program. And um, I'm sorry, that's me being caged. And um, it is um, a program that is quite well known and was mentioned by many people during our interview process. Um, it was founded by the Danish Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries and the Danish Ministry of Health in 1995, which would be kind of the equivalent of um, our CFIA and Public Health Agency of Canada. And the objectives of the program are to monitor the consumption of antimicrobial agents, to monitor the occurrence of resistance in bacteria isolated from food animals, food of animal origins, so that would be analogous to what our CPARS does, and humans, to study associations between antimicrobial consumption and antimicrobial resistance, which I think is a very laudable goal and we need to do more of that, and to identify routes of transmission and areas for future research studies. And they have three categories of what they decide to surveil in the DANMAP program. They look at human and animal pathogens. Um, this reflects primarily resistance caused by use of antimicrobial agents in the respective reservoirs. So this is the type of um, evolving resistance that I alluded to earlier. They look at um, zoonotic bacteria um, because of the importance of antibiotic use in the animal reservoir. And they looked at indicator bacteria, basically um, bacteria that are all over the place and can basically highlight the um, development of resistance through exposure to antimicrobials. Um, because they readily develop such um, resistance. And the program involves quite a lot of data flow. Um, and they basically have humans, um, samples from general practice and from hospitals that get sent in centrally and reported to DANMAP. Um, food control lab laboratories at slaughter plants also send. And food animals, um, veterinary practices, and samples in as well, which is um, interesting because not every system has that aspect covered. And the human health impact, I really like the way they do things. This was just a uh, nice um, high level look at DANMAP, looking at what they've done to decrease antimicrobial resistance in Denmark over 11 years. And they had an antibiotic awareness campaign. Um, they published reports to prescribers. They um, did mandatory notifications um, of increasing numbers of MRSA. And um, the intervention had effect, column interests me, increasing macrolide resistance in strep pneumo. They basically changed the way people practice and they decreased macrolide resistance in strep pneumo. Um, then they also, quite frankly, indicate where awareness campaign did not help. No antibiotic use still increasing, and no ciprofloxacin use and resistance still increasing. So I do appreciate um, their unflinching look at how effective these things were, because we can learn from that. Now, a program that actually relies um, more on routinely collected data and synthesis of large amounts of data, 
um, EARSNET, which is the European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network. This is a Euro European wide network um, of national surveillance systems and gives reference data on resistance for public health purposes. And it's coordinated and funded by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the EU, there's 27 member states. They have 24 official languages. There's more than 50 million inhabitants. And it's quite a patchwork of cultures. And I imagine it's a bureaucratic nightmare. And the fact that they managed to um, create a really good surveillance system through microbiology labs across 24 official languages in that bureaucracy, I think, is very heartening. And the key point here is that they collect routinely generated antimicrobial susceptibility data, provide spatial trend analysis, and give very timely access to the data via an interactive website. They also provide um, quality assurance and protocols on testing methods so that the participating labs um, can try to, I guess, harmonize their reporting and, and make sure that the standard of reporting is fairly consistent. They have 900 laboratories in 33 European countries and it ranges from 20% to 100% of the population coverage. And they don't try to look at everything, but they look at important things. Their list is Strep pneumo, Staph aureus, Enterococcus faecalis infecium, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And they also collect denominator data on lab and hospital activity and patient characteristics to help inform their reports. And just showing you some snapshots from um, the report before last because they had some extra um, useful slides on it. This is a percentage of invasive isolates showing resistance, Staph aureus, MRSA, and Klebsiella pneumonia, which had multiple drug resistance. And I like this slide for a couple of reasons. One is that it shows that MRSA has been actually well controlled in quite a number of places, including the UK. Um, there's a few places where it's still very much on the rise, and it's still very high. But um, the control of MRSA, I think, is a little bit different in that um, a lot of it can be affected through infection control practices, whereas Klebsiella pneumonia with evolving resistance on antibiotic exposure is a bit of a different scenario. And pretty much across the board, all we see is increasing combined resistance in Kleb pneumo. Another... Um, data that just shows the difference between time between 2008 and 2011, you can see that there were some places that were very heavily, heavily um, MRSA predominant that have successfully brought it down from 25 to 50 or greater than 50 percent to 5 to less than 10 percent. And that, I think, is also a very heartening thing to show that you can actually create useful actions as well. Here's a slide of E. coli, um, percentage of invasive isolates resistant to third generation cephalosporins. Um, we would consider this kind of a concerning E. coli. Uh, somewhat alarmingly, these are on the rise across, um, across Europe, pretty much across the board. And the, um, and the rates vary. Um, the highest that we see here is 25 to 50 percent, which is really unacceptable. Um, but even in places that have done a good job of controlling resistance in general, we see 5 to 10 percent type numbers. And that one we already talked about. Um, carbapenem resistance, like we said earlier, is a very hot topic. And carbapenem resistant Kleb pneumo is a huge problem in some places. I was just shocked by this one, so I decided to put it in. I, I'm not intending to give you a full tour of antimicrobial resistance in Europe, but I think that you can see that this type of data collection system, which relies on things that, is, that are already happening but synthesizes it and presents it, um, can be a very powerful tool in helping guide actions. And the reason this works is that the ECDC requires submission of data on resistance from working labs, and they have a system that works to do that. Um, and their database actually seems to function very well, and they have goals for um, acquisition of data. And they're very pragmatic. Some of the concerns that our people raised with respect to, um, you know, can we really compare data from this lab to th that lab if the testing is done the same way? Um, and they are very pragmatic, and they just say that the data has been collected at the national level, and um, sample size and coverage may vary, and that they should look at the annual reports for additional information if you're just looking at the website to help contextualize those results. So 
Um, th this is my very unofficial read of ca Canadian surveillance at the moment. Um, I think we do have very good hospital data on resistant organisms, um, especially those um, that pertain to infection prevention and control from the CNISP program. And CNISP, I understand, is also getting more information on antibiotic use in hospitals, and there are other avenues of trying to acquire that data because it's important to look at both development of resistance and use and try to correlate those factors. Um, we do have very limited accessible data on community-based evolving resistance across Canada, especially comparing to other places that have more established surveillance systems for that. Um, but we have good data on community-based antibiotic utilization from CPARS reports um, that analyze IMS-based data sets. So if we look at what we have here, those are coming in in interesting orders. Um, I think that we have a bit of a patchwork, but um, the, there, there's some good parts and bad parts to our surveillance. And challenges and considerations. So when we look at what we would like to do, um, we'd like to have integrated antimicrobial resistance surveillance. We'd like to be able to develop large-scale and widespread data collection systems, which are population-based. We'd like to devel develop surveillance systems that integrate with research questions in AMR, which is very important, especially in veterinary and agri-food realms, where I think that we, we really have to have robust data to make those connections to help guide um, best practices for industry use of antimicrobials. We have to create direct and effective mechanisms to feed information into decision-making processes in antibiotic utilization. So everyone involved in this call who is involved in antimicrobial prescribing should be able to know where to access information on current resistance trends. And we do need to develop m better methods of dissemination of information to all those who need to know. Now that strange little target thing is kind of focusing me in on the need to know. And the phrase need to know actually is commonly used in espionage and government circles on the basis of you only tell only those people who absolutely need to know because we don't want to expose anyone else to the dangers of this information, if you want to put it that way. And so it's kind of a movie phrase in my head. But on a practical level, um, I think a bit of thought as to who needs to know about resistance um, is important because I don't think that um, it's information that is necessarily requiring judgment. It's just more information of fact that can help inform what people decide to do on a daily basis. Now that's my bias. Um, putting it all together, um, our group will soon finish our report, which will include a formal review of Canadian international programs in light of key aspects of surveillance with the goal of defining and refining important and actionable recommendations. And um, I will mention that we do have good work done by good people in antimicrobial resistance surveillance, but creating a cohesive system and addressing important gaps, especially the gaps in community antimicrobial resistance surveillance is urgently needed. And so why do I have a picture of a cute baby at the end? Well, people like cute babies. But this is my reminder to just talk about why we do this sort of work. Um, at the moment, we are very fortunate. We have healthcare that's highly effective. Um, things that used to kill people are now reasonably easily treatable. But there are certainly have been signs of, of more difficult to treat infections, things that once were straightforward, um, have become a lot more complicated in some areas, and a lot of that can be tied to inappropriate um, antimicrobial use. And we are basically looking at writing the future for our grandkids as to whether or not they'll have the same advantages in healthcare that we will. And although I don't think that we're in a post-antibiotic era at this time, I think that not being prudent right now would be a mistake. And a phrase keeps on coming back to me from some of the HIV reports um, earlier on where it was said that history will judge us harshly if we don't take action right now. And I think using a precautionary principle, um, we really should be looking at antimicrobial resistance as a potential um, major future issue. And we should take appropriate steps right now to do what we can. And that will, oops, sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing.
involve surveillance because without surveillance, without knowing what's going on, we can't really um, direct what is going on. We define if there's a problem, we can help determine cause of the problem and risks. And if we identify evolving issues in antimicrobial resistance, they do need to be communicated to people who determine policy on public education and intervention programs, people who educate healthcare workers, anyone who treats patients, and everyone involved in antibiotic stewardship. And so I think this ends my slides, and I'm hoping that people will have some um, thoughts or questions that they can share in the question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Saxinger. We have a little problem with the Q&A pod, but I do seem to have a few questions up on the screen here that I can see. The first one is, when do you expect the report to be published? Uh, before Christmas. Um, so it was meant to come out earlier, but as I mentioned, we had some, I think, really useful feedback that kind of changed um, the direction we were going with the data presentation. And so we're doing a bit of a redo. We don't have to recollect data, but we are kind of redigesting it. And so we're looking to get that done within the next month or so. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't seem to see any other questions appearing right now. I just want to give it a moment. Um, but I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the participants and encourage you to fill out our one-minute survey that is featured on the last slide that is being put up shortly. Your feedback is very valuable and will greatly enhance Antibiotic Awareness Week activities in Canada for 2014. If you click the link now, you can participate in the survey while wait for additional questions. Oh, I just saw one come up. Um, do we currently have any evidence of increased rates of resistance in regions or community with higher rates of prescription and utilization? Uh, that, I mean, I, I would say yes. Um, but it's difficult in the absence of just, you know, localized regional reports or publications to say because we have high rates of utilization of this antibiotic here, we have high rates of um, antimicrobial resistance to that antibiotic here. Um, someone from BC has a good system for looking at prescriptions and resistance together, and I think they probably have some of the better data that can demonstrate those correlations. And I think one goal of a surveillance system would always be to be able to look at both the utilization and the resistance um, so that we don't have unintended consequences. When we try to redirect prescribers or rewrite guidelines for certain antimicrobials for certain conditions, that we make sure that we're not inadvertently creating an unexpected different resistance profile that might be even more negative by doing so. And that certainly has been something that's been seen in hospital settings because um, there, there are complicated mechanisms of resistance that can lead to unanticipated outcomes. I'm just going to see if there's anything else. Oh, here's one. Uh, Dr. Kettner. Uh, do you think an electronic health record? Yes. Um, electronic health records um, would be very, very useful as long as we can get everything to talk with each other to help um, both build in prescriber support and guidelines into the prescribing system. So computerized order entry is a very well-established antimicrobial stewardship and actually overall drug stewardship tool. And with that information, you should be able to link also antimicrobial utilization resistance um, data and help actually very directly impact antimicrobial utilization patterns. And so I think that the, the goal of electronic health records are not just to do the basics of making sure all the people looking after the patient know, um, know the available information on that patient, but can actually really make a big difference in improving processes of care. Um, I have another one. Yes. Um, making AROs, ESBLs, um, carbapenem-resistant organisms um, reportable. 
That's interesting, actually. Um, someone else might be able to feed into that, so feel free to type in comments if you know. Um, ESDLs within hospitals tend to be reported to infection control. In the community, um, depending on where you are, there are, is some monitoring, um, lab-based monitoring of ESBL rates, but certainly that's not something that I've seen officially reported. And it would be, I think, of great interest to see different patterns across the country. Even locally here, we found that our ESBL um, rates are much higher in certain communities that tend to have people um, that are of a certain ethnic background. So I mean, there's like diaspora from Southeast Asia, uh, communities that are fairly large and with a fair amount of travel back and forth that tend to have um, higher rates of certain organisms. And that I think is a notable trend and one that could be watched as well. And it could help inform how we decide to treat patients as well. Um, so the CNSP data for antimicrobial utilization DDDs um, is hopefully all this fear around, um, uh, around uh, uh, surveillance and inflammatory comments in the media will die down enough for people to get a breath and um, have a look at, at that data. But it's been in process and there's been a few different thoughts about how that data will be used. Um, I'm hoping that it will be moved on pretty quickly because now I think they have two or three years worth of data from participating sites and that might prove very useful in, um, in, uh, in determining, I think, not really benchmarks, but um, the, what is being used in hospitals and where and if there's any, if there's any like outlying patterns, if there's any beneficial ones or adverse ones that should be studied and shared as well. And then, now, now there's so many comments coming up, I can't actually see them all. Here we go. Uh, David, how can we determine if favorable changes in trends are simply natural fluctuations? Well, yes, excellent question. Always a good question. And I have no problem with surfing to success on the back of an ep epidemic curve. But I think that really when we're looking at that type of data, you de do need a period of time um, with it to, uh, to kind of track the inputs and look at the patterns. And um, there always is that concern. And I think that um, the data that you have from the Do Bugs Need Dr Drugs program in BC is an example where the time series analysis seems to be quite compellingly um, convincing that you can change utilization to change resistance. But um, being able to address that question, I think, very conclusively might be a bit of a challenge. Um, I appreciate your comment back on that, actually. Um, Dina Sabuda, I like the idea of making arrows reportable. Yeah, it is a public health concern. Um, the other thing would be, I guess, if we were able to establish lab-based um, antimicrobial susceptibility test-based surveillance, that would come as a consequence of that. So if basically um, lab antibiograms lab resistance data that's generated daily across the, pr across the country were to be made available in a data warehousing system similar to the ECDC, just as a con consequence of that, you would be able to look at um, the changes in ESBL isolation over, over time by looking at the changes in carbapenem resistance in certain organisms. And that would make, um, I guess, invoking the public health reportable disease arm um, less necessary, but still give you useful information. And I believe that this presentation and the, um, the voiceover will be available on this website as the previous ones have been. Um, so I think that this will remain available. And um, I hope people enjoyed it. I'd be interested, as I mentioned, if people feel like typing in comments. Oh, causal inference. OK. Um, that's true. Um, so when we're talking about how to tell if you've, if you've used your, you've collected your data, you've analyzed your data, you have um, disseminated your data, and you've made some programmatic changes as a result of it, how can you tell if what you've done has made a difference? And I think that you're right, it's much more diffuse in a community setting, whereas in hospital settings, I think that you, you actually can get better ideas, um, just because you can, you can, do interventions in different places or over different times and um, have a little bit um, better oversight of the other variables in that kind of setting. And I think that is, that is um, something that we could look at. 
um, as we evolve antimicrobial stewardship infrastructure and connections in Canada, because I think hospitals are an important place for antibiotic resistance generation because we both create it and we also find its manifestations coming in from the community as well. And um, because of the high intensity of antibiotic use in hospitals, I think that they do have a very important um, place for stewardship and resistance in the overall setting. And so although I tend to harp on community-based resistance, I do think that the hospital-based resistance and the infection control aspects of resistance are very important. Um, interesting comment that I'll just make quickly is we were recently looking at our uh, febrile neutropenia protocols because of a perception of a spate of bacteremias with resistant organisms in this very um, fragile patient population. And reviewing the infection control bloodstream infection data um, was interesting, but our infection control database doesn't include the susceptibility testing. So I had to go and put in all the susceptibilities into the infection control um, list so that I could see um, what types of resistance these organisms had. Now, um, I guess this just goes to the idea of siloization because the infection control data and the etiology of the bloodstream infections and whether or not they're line related is all very important. But had we had um, you know, the requirement of including susceptibility data with that, even though it doesn't have a direct infection control need, um, we would have been able to more easily collaborate on refining our febrile neutropenia protocols. And so it just kind of talks a little bit to the idea of an integrated system and how important that might be going forward on a lot of different levels. So I think we're almost out of time. I'm going to see if anyone else has any comments. And I'm not really seeing any. Um, Hi, Dr. Saxender. Yep. Yeah, I believe that is all the time we have for questions. I would like to give you a big thanks for your informative presentation and the question and answer period. I encourage participants to again take the time to fill out the one minute survey. It will help, the feedback will help for next year's antibioticawareness.ca site and webinar. And I would like to also thank the partner organizations who helped to make Antibiotic Awareness Week a success. Remember to use your antibiotics wisely when needed and as prescribed. Goodbye and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.